um, this is our next in the series of one book lectures. This is the fifth year of the one book project at Bristol Community College. And our selected book this year is In the Hard Sea, the family Philbrick. How many of you are reading a book in any course? Can you come over show me? So, so many? Okay. Well, whether you're reading the book or not, you're in for a treat. Um, from our speaker today is going to be talking about this interesting subject. So we'll be hearing from him in just a minute. I'll just give a little introduction. Um, and by the way, this lecture will only go to quarter two, so if you have something at two, don't worry, we'll be able to get to it um, in plenty of time. Um, there'll also be a question and answer period, so as you're listening, feel free to jot down a few questions for our speaker. So thank you for coming. Uh, let me introduce our speaker. Um, w. Jeffrey Bolster is professor of history at the University of New Hampshire. Author, co-author, or editor of five books, Professor Bolster is well known for Blackjacks, African American Seamen in the Age of Sail. Co-winner of the American Historical Association's 1997 Award for Best Book in African American History and the New York Times Notable Book of the Year. His most recent book, The North Sea, Fishing the Atlantic in the Age of Sail, won the Bancroft Prize for 2012 and the John Lyman Book Award as the best book in American maritime history for 2012. Licensed by the U.S. Coast Guard as Master of Motor, Steam, and Auxiliary Sail Vessels of Not More Than 200 Gross Tons Upon Oceans. That's quite a title. Yeah, you got that, huh? <laughs> right, read that right off the license. <laughs> Professor Bolster went to sea commercially as a young man, and he continues to mess about in boats whenever possible. So please welcome Jeff Bolster. Thanks, Denise, and thanks everybody for coming out. Is the sound good? People can hear me up there? Yeah? All right. So I gather that this campus has a very cool program, which is to have people in multiple classes read the same book, provide a little commonality for discussion. Uh, this is a book I know pretty well, and I thought I'd start out talking a little bit about that book and then segue into um, some other material from a book that I wrote. So this is a wonderful book. It's gripping. It's powerful. It's compelling. It gets in your bones. It is this story, a reconstruction, a recovery by a first-rate writer, Nathaniel Philbrick, of events that really happened. So it's true, and in many ways it is, of course, stranger than life. The book starts, of course, on the island of Nantucket, the nation of Nantucket, this island just a half day's sail off of Cape Cod that had been settled since the 17th century by stern New Englanders, many of whom became Quakers. Nantucket's sort of a barren place. It was a rough place to make a living. Someone jokingly called it a barren sandbank fertilized with whale oil. Because ultimately, the people of Nantucket, the white people, the black people, and the Wampanoag people, ultimately discovered that these little floating oil wells came conveniently past their shores each spring. The right whales, as they called them, a baleen whale, not a toothed whale, not a, a killer whale, a whale that filters out plankton and small fish, came conveniently past the shores each spring. And these whales were worth money. Initially, Nantucket whalemen simply scavenged dead whales off the beach, as the Indians had done for centuries before. Whales would die, they'd get stranded, they'd wash up, go down to the beach, cut up the whale, stinky, smelly business, boil the oil, in the fat in big cauldrons, it's like putting a piece of bacon in a frying pan. We typically put the bacon in the pan, and when all is done, we pour off the oil, maybe get rid of that, and then eat the meat. What the Nantucketers did is they put the chunks of whale in the pot and skimmed off the oil, got rid of the meat. Okay, but basically they're cooking whales to make grease. The first American oil men were not Texans, by the way. They're Nantucketers. So the problem is they were very good whale men. And they went from scavenging dead whales to killing live whales and then going offshore in their boats and harpooning whales. And pretty soon they depleted the whales in coastal waters, forcing them to go offshore farther in pursuit of a much more challenging prey, the sperm whale. This was not a whale that just sucked up plankton. This was a big toothed whale that was accustomed to killing things to make its living. This was a whale that lived in the deep sea that required stronger, more powerful ships 
with apparatus on board to actually boil the whale out there. Ultimately, those whale stocks were depleted too. At the risk of being crassly commercial and promoting my own most recent book, I've written this uh, environmental history of the North Atlantic. It ranges from Cape Cod to Newfoundland. It ranges back and forth across to Europe. It explores how people through time, deep time, a thousand years of time, have affected the North Atlantic ecosystem, the living ocean resources uh, on which many communities like New Bedford, Fairhaven, Nantucket, Fall River, and others along the line. But we won't go into that book this time. <laughs> so let's go back to our story, Nathaniel Philbricks in the heart of the sea. In 1819, this stout little whale ship, a veteran of many voyages uh, abroad, an old ship, but still they thought a good ship, left Nantucket with a crew of 21, some of whom were just mere teenagers. This is a crew of black Americans and white Americans, uh, no native or Wampanoag men in this crew, but they were divided in different ways. They were Nantucketers. First and foremost, the core crew, there were nine men that were white Nantucketers. They were clannish. They were almost like brothers because they were from this inbred little community. And then there were five off-islanders. All off-islanders were called coofs. Five of those coofs, they were white men. And then there were another group of coofs, seven of them initially, that were African-American men. So the ship, this tiny little ship, was spatially segregated and hierarchically segregated in certain ways, not just from the officers and the mid-level officers and the common sailors, but segregated as well by one's place of origin, one's race, okay? This would turn out to have a dramatic role in the story that unfollowed the tragedy of the Essex. So if I can use a little, where we go? There, they went across to the Azores, uh, down to the Cape Verdes, down around the bottom of South America, Cape Horn, across the coast of Chile and Peru and Ecuador. One of the black men in Ecuador, one of the black men on the ship, decided by the time he got to Ecuador, he'd had enough of this. And he jumped ship. He bailed out. He deserted. Very common. So now they're down to 20 guys. They go out to the Galapagos. They kill some tortoises, put some tortoises, live tortoises on board for food. And then they sail out onto the edge of the moon, out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, where very, very few New Englanders had gone before. Actually, where very few Europeans had gone before. This was out there. They were a thousand miles west of the Galapagos. And the reason they were that far away, my friends, is because the whales that had once been so convenient for the taking, washing up on the beaches of Nantucket, were gone. The whales that you could reach by two days sailing from Nantucket in a small ship out past the Gulf Stream were gone. The whales that you could reach by going to the Azores or the Cape Verdes were gone. And now these guys in 1820 were sailing halfway around the world to look for the whales that would make their paychecks. <coughs> this little drawing comes from the uh, journal of Thomas Nickerson, the youngest lad on the ship. He was 14 years old. He was at the helm on that memorial day, of, uh, memorable day of November 20th, when a mighty bull sperm whale swam right into the ship. A whale that demonstrated the vengeance and the malice of a human being. A whale that turned and came back and hit the ship a second time. In 1820, no Nantucketer, despite more than a century of whaling, had ever heard of a whale ramming a ship. And now these 20 men on this small ship a thousand miles west of the Galapagos confronted the fact that their ship was sinking. 20 men with meager provisions and supplies in three small whale boats. I got an artist's rendition of a whale boat here and then one of the replica whale boats at Mystic Seaport <laughs> Museum being lowered from the Charles Morgan. Shows you the size of these boats. 20 men in these three boats are now confronting an eternity of ocean miles. So what next? Here we are, guys. We took a flyer. We went outbound from Nantucket to make our living, earning our daily bread on the waters. We understood it was dangerous. We understood that some men didn't come back from these ventures. But in general, they did. In general, the ships were staunch. In general, most men returned. But now you're out there on the edge of the known world. 
with 19 other guys and these three little boats, and what are you going to do? Well, it turns out that where they were in the trade wind zone, by sailing west, sailing west, you always go west around the world, in the middle of the world, you would come to these islands like the Tuamotos or Tahiti, lush tropical paradises. Islands that were easy to find because they're volcanic, towering above the sea, big cloud cover above them. Downwind, easy sail. But the chief mate, Owen Chase, and the second mate, Matthew Joy, were rattled. They understood that these islands were the home of cannibals and savages. And they thought it would be too risky. So they convinced the captain, Captain Pollard, who was not a particularly strong man, that instead of sailing downwind, it would have been easy. And finding these tall islands, that they should sail to windward, 2,500 miles in the direction of the wind, back to the coast of Chile or Peru, because it was more known and more safe and supposedly less savage. And as Thomas Nickerson wrote many years later in his journal of this, he was one of the survivors, as he wrote, from that decision, how many hearts of brave young sailors ceased to beat. So the decision spoke to Nantucketers' arrogance, their xenophobia, the fact that they were afraid of these cannibals. But there's a dark, dark irony there, an irony that lies at the heart of Philbrick's book. Eight men lived to tell the tale. And we can ask, how was Philbrick able to reconstruct this story? Well, it turns out two of those men left first-hand accounts. They left survivors' memoirs. Lo and behold, they all left certain things out. Lo and behold, when people write about stuff that they are doing, especially if it's controversial, they don't always tell the full truth. So he had those accounts to rely on. He also had the accounts of men who had encountered the survivors straight away the captain or mate of a ship who had picked up a few of these guys in a whaleboat, a U.S. Navy surgeon who had treated them in Valparaiso, Chile, when some of them got there. So they had these other accounts. So Philbrick, masterful writer, was able to stitch this story together based on a lot of evidence. And I really encourage you to read the book if you haven't. It's a wonderfully reconstructed story. He, he is the kind of guy, Philbrick, who follows a lot of leads and he can speak to the physiology and psychology of starvation. He can speak to uh, Polynesian Islanders' voyages across the mighty Pacific and why today Polynesian Islanders tend to be more obese than Caucasians or, or Africans. He spoke to sailing ship technology and navigational constraints of the day. It's really a wonderful book that works in many ways, but it is a tragedy. Herman Melville, met the teenage son of the first mate, Owen Chase, one of the survivors, many years later in the South Pacific. Herman Melville found, got a copy of Owen Chase's narrative of this, and ultimately, the story of the Essex, the true story of the Essex, became part of the imaginary fuel, the literature that fueled Melville's imagination to write the book Moby Dick. I'd encourage you to read that one, too. One of my favorites, an encyclopedic, if uh, exasperating, sprawling kind of work. But so in any way, in any event, the story of the Essex has worked its way into American literature. But let's ask ourselves, of the 20 men, who survived? It turns out only eight. Only eight lived to tell the tale. Two of those were white Nantucketers in Captain Pollard's boat, and three were white Nantucketers from Chief Mate Chase's boat. And then three off-island whites who actually when they found a deserted island, Henderson Island, near Pitcairn, they decided to stay there. None of the six African-American seamen survived. In fact, I would say that the black sailors in this account were the largely invisible actors in this high seas drama. And what's especially telling is that one of those men, William Bond, who had been the steward, that's like the, the cook and the uh, man in charge of the provisions for the ship, when the whale rammed the Essex, it was William Bond, the African-American steward, who had the presence of mind to go down below as the ship is sinking and to grab the captain's and the chief mate's chests that had the navigational instruments, two compasses, two quadrants, which you measure the angle of the stars, 
two copies of Bowditch's American Practical Navigator and some charts. Without those, not a single man would have ever lived to tell the tale. And yet, we know very little of the black men aboard this ship. There are no images that remain of those men the way there are some images or photographs of some of the white sailors. Nothing was written by them, not much about them. So historians, when they're faced with that sort of dilemma, we would actually like to know something more about those brothers. Where did they come from? What was their backstory? How did they end up on this ship? Faced with that dilemma, historians resort to what's called collective biography. If we can't nail down one individual, Owen Chase, the chief mate who wrote a book about the story and about whom much is known, what can we reconstruct about the collectivity of men of color who worked at sea in that era? That's where I come in. That's why Denise called me and asked me to come down today. Um, years ago, I wrote this book called Black Jacks, Black Jack Tars, African-American Seamen in the Age of Sail. So I'd like to segue from the, from the Philbrick book a little bit into what I found out and was able to reconstruct about men of color uh, on American ships during the Age of Sail. Okay? As a young guy, I went to sea and I spent a lot of time in the West Indies, actually, the Caribbean. And there, while there in the 1970s, I'd run into these guys sailing these little freight sl sloops and schooners around. They were interesting. They struck my, my imagination. Men like this that I talked to in Anguilla one night who talked about carrying cattle under sail from the Eastern Caribbean to Santo Domingo, careening their, their sloops at Grenada and this and that. And it sort of fired my imagination. These old guys were doing something that I was intrigued with. I was just fresh out of college myself. I was down in the islands. You know, I would bought a one-way ticket to the Caribbean. I'm going to jump ups or dances in the goat fields working on some boats. And nah, I'm never thinking I'm going to write a book. I'm just like talking to this old brother because he's interesting to me, what he's doing. One night, sailing into Cape Haitian Haiti on a schooner called the Harvey Gamage that some of you may have seen here on the coast. Um, there were some, we had a group of college kids on board. I was a junior officer. But the, one of the professors had an account by a man named Olada Equiano, a, a, a slave, a slave sailor who had formerly sailed right in those waters. So I began to ask myself, what were the connections between old black men like this who I was talking to in the 1970s and the connections with a black sailor 200 years before, who in the 1770s had written a memoir, some of you may have read it, about his experience as a slave sailor in the Atlantic world. So that just sort of stuck in my head. It seems to me that images endure, and that the image that has persisted to link historic African American people to historic sailing ships has been images like this or like this, images of black people being acted on but not acting of their own volition, people being treated as cargoes rather than as sailors. These are powerful images, and these are not something we want to suppress or forget. But sometimes the power of those images can also suppress other stories, competing stories, true stories, stories like this man. He might have been the brother, or, I mean the, uh, the father or the uncle of some of those black sailors who were on the Essex. It would have been this painting's about one generation before the time of the American Revolution. So here's a man of color sailing on American ships, 1780s, okay? Uh, what can we know about this guy? What can we learn about him? How can we, how can we link his experiences, reconstruct his experiences, and ask some questions about the meanings for him as a man of color in that age when slavery was the norm and sailing ships were the means of commerce around the Atlantic world. And more than that, besides asking these questions, how could we do it? It turns out that the US government, since the early 1790s, has required every ship leaving an American port to file in the Customs House a crew list of who the sailors are on board. This law is still in effect. When I was going to sea in the 1970s and 1980s, by the time I was sailing as master, I filled out a lot of these crew lists. So my fantasy is that sometime in the future, long after I'm dead, someone will write a book about hippie sailing school ship programs in the 1970s, and they'll use my crew lists. Cool. But as a historian, 20 years ago, I'm at Brown University, actually, in a master's program. 
and I needed to write on something. So I go into the archives, the Rhode Island Historical Society, and I begin to find hundreds of these crew lists from the early 1800s, sailing ships out of Providence, Rhode Island, sailing ships out of Newport. Later, I went to look for sailing ships out of uh, Salem, Massachusetts, and New York City and Baltimore. But the point is, I'm unfolding these documents. They're still folded up with the blotting sand in them that had been folded in 200 years before. They're written in quill pens with the captain's own hand. And what they show is that about 18% of the men on these cargo ships during the early 19th century, American cargo ships, about 18%, almost one-fifth, were African-American men. This got my attention. I'd been to all the maritime museums in the US. Not much about black guys. I'd read all the books about seafaring labor. Not much about black guys. And yet now when I'm looking at the crew lists, written in the captain's own hand, about 20% of the men on these ships are African-American men. And then I think back to the old man I talked to in the West Indies. I thought back to reading Olada Equiano's narrative of a slave sailor 200 years before. I said, maybe there's a story here. So instead of just thinking about this Atlantic world of having a merchant and a slave producer and a sailor who happened to be a white sailor, Jolly Jack Tar with his pipe, um, you could imagine that this plantation system was manned in part by black sailors as well. Very important. Like this image from Havana Harbor called Watson and the Shark. It's a very famous painting. It's in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. The artist John Singleton Copley was commissioned or paid by Watson, who's the guy in the water. Watson was a white guy. He was a sailor on a ship, and they got to Havana. He went for a swim. He didn't hear the dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun in the background. And by the time his shipmates got to him, that shark had taken off one of his legs. But he was a tough bugger. The shipmates got him in the boat, they put a tourniquet on his leg, they brought him back to the ship, they lost his leg to the surgeon, but he didn't die. And years later, he had gone ashore and made a lot of money as a successful merchant, and he then commissioned the artist to paint a picture of the day that changed his life. True story. When the artist gave the guy the sketches for the picture, the crew in the boat were all white guys. And Watson said, no, one of the dudes that pulled me out that day was a black guy, my shipmate, put him in the picture. So then suddenly the artist changed it to make the black man sort of the center of attention in the picture. But the point is, this is a true story, and I use it to get us to think about how race worked on these sailing ships. I'm not saying that these were colorblind environments. They weren't. I'm not saying that black men didn't bear most of the burdens, because they did. That's how the racial system worked. But it turns out that the rules of the ship, the law of the sea, the hierarchy of the ship, gave black men more room to maneuver than in lots of other places ashore. And when Watson told the artist, put the brother in the picture, he's one of the guys that saved me, he was honoring his shipmate from decades ago, a man of color who had uh, been his friend and helped save his life. So if we begin to push this a little bit, we, we realize that that uh, black men in boats, black men on ships, were crucial to making this plantation system work. This is a picture from Barbados. If you've ever seen a Mount Gay rum bottle, there's a nice map of Barbados on the label. You can see Spitestown. But what this is, is a small boat working the beach in Barbados, manned by slaves, moving goods between the ship anchored offshore and the beach, because they don't have a big pier where the ship can come in. Maritime slaves making the system work. Here we have Antigua, maritime slaves making the system work. These are very well-dressed slaves, mind you, but uh, they're rolling hogsheads of sugar or rum into this little boat, going out to that sloop or schooner, which would then go around the corner to St. John's, the major harbor. The sloop and the schooner were captained by slave sailors. The boats were manned by slave sailors. The whole commercial system worked, not just with people of color producing sugar in the fields, but people of color adding value to that commerce by working in the maritime network that would bring it to a place like Boston or London or whatever. So imagine this cabin boy, where is he? Do I have a little, yeah, this black kid up here. He's down on the decks of this Navy ship in the 1780s. You can see the cannons and the dogs and the hookers. His life is very different, sailing around the Atlantic world, going between London and Jamaica and Boston and wherever, than if he was cutting sugarcane or hoeing tobacco in some field. He's a slave. 
or a servant. He's burdened by the burdens of race and his racial system. But his eyes are wide open, and he's seen the entire Atlantic world. So we ask ourselves, how did these men of color get aboard these ships? It's a great picture, huh? Anybody ever been to a party where the dog ended up wearing a wig? <laughs> See, this is, this is a, the aft cabin of, of a British Navy ship. And we have the, the officers sitting around the table, and the punch bowl's been going around because by this time the dog is wearing the wig. But uh, you see the black man in the back, he's a musician. It's very common aboard these ships to have a man of color beating the drum, blowing the French horn, playing the fiddle. The white naval officers knew that their status would be enhanced if they were waited on by a man of color. So sometimes men of color got aboard these ships as a musician or a cabin steward or a cook. But then, like the black sailor back under the palm tree talking to the soldier in Jamaica, once they got aboard ship, they of course began to learn the arts of the sailor, how to hand and reef and steer, how to turn in a tidy splice, how to send down a four topsail yard. And they became sometimes, like this man here under the palm tree, able-bodied seamen. So what we have is by the time of the American Revolution, ships like these tobacco ships crossing the Atlantic, connecting that Atlantic world, making the commercial enterprise work, manned increasingly by not just white Americans or white Europeans, but again, about 20% of the sailors on these ships were men of African descent. Some were technically free, as much as free meant. Many were technically slaves, but they had to run from their masters to the relative freedom of the sailing ship on the high seas. So if you imagine this map of the Atlantic as the black Atlantic, and you imagine not only those 11 million captives forced against their will sailed across that sea of death from West Africa to the Americas, put to work on plantations between Argentina and Nova Scotia. If you imagine this as the Black Atlantic as well, it's not just that movement of captives against their will, but then there's this circulation of men and boys, slave and free, men of color, moving around, connecting the far-flung communities of the African diaspora. So what did sailors carry in their heads? Food styles, martial arts styles, hairstyles, rumors, news, music. And what you're beginning to see here is that the far-flung African diaspora, whether in Venezuela or Jamaica or Maryland or wherever, is being connected at this time by men of color moving around in sailing ships. So the image that we've had is, is slaves fast in their chains and fixed in one location. But what I'm trying to point out here is that it's very, very well documented that lots of black men were circulating around this Atlantic world. And I have tons of examples if you want to ask me. <laughs> so let's think about this. When I got into this project trying to reconstruct the stories of black sailors, I realized after a while that the first six autobiographies published by black men in the English language were all written by sailors. It's like, oh. That got my attention. What happened? Well, it turns out that like William Bond, the black man aboard the Essex, who was the cabin steward that saved the officer's navigational instruments as the ship was sinking, that like William Bond, many black men aboard ships worked in the aft cabin. They worked with the officers. What was in the aft cabin? The books, the charts, the maps, the navigational instruments. The aft cabin was the center of education. Guys who understood science and cartography, guys who were literate. So a number of these black sailors, like William Bond, like Olada Equiano, who wrote that compelling narrative, they were working aboard ships, going from port to port, but they were surrounded by books and charts and scientific instruments. They were functioning in a literate world. So if one of those brothers had something to say, and he got to New York or Boston or London and basically said, I want to write a memoir. I want to write an anti-slavery tract. I want to tell the story of my life, whatever. I'm a Methodist and I have something to say. He could sometimes find a patron, someone who would help him get his piece published. Okay. 
So the first six autobiographies written by black men in the English language were written by sailors. And if you want to shift to women of color in American letters, uh, the famous uh, story Our Nig by Harriet Wilson, a, a woman of color raised in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, uh, she was married to a sailor. Okay, wherever you look, men of color with seafaring experience are part of the age of slavery, the age of sail. So these are two of the narratives. We have the life of Olada Equiano and also the life history and unparalleled sufferings by John G., the African preacher. Both of these guys were very experienced seamen. Anybody here read the Equiano narrative? Anybody? We have two of us for Equiano? Oh, it's a generational thing. Yeah. So um, this, uh, this book is readily available now. There's a cheap paperback edition you can get for a couple of bucks. It is the most compelling of all of these slave narratives, written in the 1780s by a man who was initially an Igbo man from today, which is Nigeria, who came across the waters when he was about 10 or 12 years old, who then spent time in the British Navy, spent time on cargo ships, blah, 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 ended up living in London, wrote this very compelling story. It is a picaresque adventure story of a man of color, a brilliant man, uh, in the late 18th century, struggling against the injustice of race in the Atlantic world. Um, anyway, and this is an image we think of him. And if you read his story, he is the... Um, He's the kind of guy who sailed into the Mediterranean and observed the Turk, as they called Muslims in those days, and their systems of slavery. He sailed to Nicaragua. He sailed towards the Arctic Circle. He went all through the Caribbean in these slave societies and lived for a while, a number of years, on the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean, which was ravaged by a, a volcano some years ago. Um, very well documented life, and it's been corroborated by uh, scholars who have looked into into his, his account, his very powerful story. John G. He too was born, uh, well, he was born in the Bight of Biafra, actually. He came across the waters at about age two with his parents, very uncommon, and was enslaved in the state of New York. And at the time of the American Revolution, th that turmoil, G was a teenager, and he walked away from his master, took to the roads, and ultimately went to sea. He hated going to sea, but he went to sea for years. Why? It was one of the few jobs as a free man of color he could get. And it also allowed him to spread the gospels that he cared about. And what gospels were those? Well, there was a Methodist evangelism. There was a radical egalitarianism. And there was a, a, an incipient black nationalism. John G. was a preacher. He was an evangelist. He was an avowed black nationalist. And he wanted to convince people of color around the Atlantic world to follow his lead. He would have been extraordinarily poised or perhaps insufferable. But, um, but he went to sea because it provided three hots and a cot. It provided him room and board and some wages in a system that otherwise didn't have much, much opening for, for black men. But it allowed him to do what he wanted to do, which was spread those messages that he cared about. Captain Paul Cuffey, some of you may have heard of Paul Cuffey, he was from Westport, Mass, nearby here, the most prominent black American of his generation. Uh, Paul Cuffey was a young man during the American Revolution, later became the wealthiest black man in America. He owned a number of cargo ships, including the one there under his bust, uh, that's the Brig Traveler that he built with his own hands and his associates at his shipyard in Westport, Mass. Cuffey is shown here <clears throat> suspended between his father's palm studded Africa, his father was an Ashanti man, and his mother's rock bound New England coast. His mother was a Wampanoag Indian. Cuffey was deep. As a young guy, teens, early 20s, he described himself as Musta. My nature is Musta. Musti or Musta was a cross between African and Native American people. Cuffey married a Native American woman and he raised his children. As he got older, however, he said, I am of the African race. He changed his race. Well, now, he didn't really change his race, but he changed his, his political consciousness. He realized by the time he was an adult and a wealthy man, the wealthiest black man in America, that it was more important for him to sort of side with, to throw his lot with the enslaved brothers and sisters of the diaspora. And he became a black nationalist and ultimately 
put his fortune and some of his ships at the disposal of the, quote, back to Africa movement because he said, wealthiest black man in America, he said, people of color here are never going to get a fair shake. It just ain't going to work. We should be out of here. And he argued about that with his friend James Fortin, who was a sail maker in Philadelphia, a man of the same age, a well-to-do man. Fortin, who ran a sail loft, a sail manufacturing place, hiring white and black men, working side by side. Both of these men had been at sea during the revolution. Both of these men had gone to sea afterwards. Both of these men had family members and friends who went to sea. They were very cosmopolitan. And Fortin said, no, Brother Cuff. We have built this place with our blood and our sweat and our tears. It's our place. We are not Africans. We are of Africa, but we are not Africans. We belong here. So these two guys, prominent black Americans of that era, well-to-do, all seamen, all connected to seamen, that cosmopolitan vision, were in that forefront of arguing about what would be the future of blacks' place in America. Anybody ever seen this picture in a textbook or uh, anywhere? Anybody got any recognition on this one? This is actually very cool. Okay, so about 20 years ago, 18 years ago, whatever, I'm researching this book and I'm trying to collect the images that you're seeing here tonight that are published in the book. In fact, I can say to you with some satisfaction, um, my initial contract with Harvard Press uh, uh, made provision for about 18 images. Ultimately, I kept feeding my editor pictures. We ended up with 36. When the book came out, it was the most richly illustrated book ever at that point in early American black history. In other words, black history up to the time of the Civil War. There were all these pictures hiding in plain sight. One of them was this. This is an oil painting that was hanging in a doctor's office in Rhode Island. I found out about it through the network of doing research in black seafaring, and I called up the doctor, and he generously said he'd provide a, a nice quality color slide for me that we could reproduce in the book. Cool. So we talked a little bit, exchanged correspondence, he sent me the image, and I put it in the book. And I wrote with good, full faith that this was a privateersman, probably from Newport, Rhode Island, at the time of the American Revolution. Okay? A couple of years ago, about six years ago, Dr. McBurney was going to loan his painting, which had been hanging in his living room since the 1970s. He said this guy had become almost like a member of the family. He was going to loan his painting for an exhibit that was going to hang in New York City about blacks in the revolution. And they sent the painting out for conservation and cleaning for, you know, spruce it up a little bit. You know what's going to happen. The conservator started rubbing on the painting, rubbing on the man's hand actually, and lo and behold, the shoe polish started coming off. It was a painting from about 1780 of a privateersman from Rhode Island, but it was a mere white man. And in the 1970s, as Americans are becoming more racially conscious and basically looking for heroes of color from the past, someone decided, we'll take this not very good painting of a white man and we'll turn him into a black guy and we'll have something. And McBurney had hung the painting in his house for 35 or 40 years. The painting was valued at $300,000. When they discovered it was a white guy under that shoe policy, it went down to $1,300. McBurney said, you know, he's been part of the family for all these years. We're going to put him back on the wall. My point here is in the 1970s, Americans finally got their heads around the fact that they needed some heroes of color in the past to tell the American story. And somebody actually went as far as fraudulently doctoring an oil painting from that, from that era. Anyway, so here's a ship right from the time of the Essex sailing. This ship, uh, the Abula, was painted about 1819, the year that the Essex left Nantucket. It's a ship of very similar proportions and scale. And, uh, Probably can't see you from where you are, but there's a black sailor prominently displayed. This guy right here is an African-American man. This painting's at Mystic Seaport Museum. I use the painting to get us to think about ships as one of the most technically complicated pieces of gear in that society. And black men on shore, even in the north that was supposedly free, were largely excluded from the skilled trades. If you were a black man in South Carolina, you might be a skilled iron worker, a skilled Finnish carpenter. But if you were a black man in Rhode Island or Connecticut, you couldn't pursue those trades because the white folks around would not let you. So one of the few things that black men found they could do and exercise a craft skill and sometimes make a living was go to sea. Now, there was the glass ceiling not so glass, that prevented them for the most part from getting promoted to be officers, but they nevertheless could, could use their skill as able-bodied seamen 
hand, reef, and steer, rig a ship, salvage anchors. Uh, oftentimes, I found in my research, many of the oldest experienced hands, the able-bodied men on these ships, were um, African-American men who did not get promoted to officers. The competent white guys got promoted to become officers. The competent black guys stayed as ABs. And some got hurt, fell from the yards, and went under the surgeon's saw. <coughs> Um, we'll skip that one. There's another painting in which I'll just mention this quickly. This painting, which is now in the uh, Maritime Museum in St. Michael's, the artist took concerns to make all the guys back here, their little faces were blobs of Caucasian paint, and all the guys up here on the foredeck, their faces were little blobs of African American paint. So the artist, 1830, 28, 1830, something like that, the artist was aware that he was depicting a reality of his society, okay? But when I was researching this book, I would go into these historical societies and archives and say, I'm here to work on black sailors. And people would say, well, you probably aren't gonna find much. I got this from old people and young people, black archivists and white archivists, female archivists and male archivists. They just said, eh, you're probably not gonna find much because there was this vibe that, well, people of color don't really go sailing. Well, we're not talking about the yacht club here. You know, we're talking about people making a living in 1820. So the artist who had painted this painting, with many of these others I'm showing you, had made sure to include that all the guys in the foredeck were black guys. But when you go into the libraries in New Bedford or whatever, trying to research a story, people say to me, oh, I don't think you're going to find very much. And yet I found a lot. I just share this because it shows how race trifles with us and how sometimes what we think we know isn't really predicated on fact. Frederick Douglass, most of you heard about him. Frederick Douglass grew up as a slave on the eastern shore of Maryland, and he said, here I am fast in my chains and a slave, and what I see out on the waters of that bay are these white-winged ships, loosed from their moorings and free. And he swore, this bay, this Chesapeake Bay, shall take me to freedom. Douglass ultimately went to Baltimore. He was working in a shipyard, he was caulking which is what this black man was doing a century later in Massachusetts, actually, caulking a deck. And ultimately, Frederick Douglass got to freedom. He got out of slavery because a free black sailor in Baltimore risked seven years in a penitentiary and a $300 fine, and he loaned Frederick Douglass his Seaman's Protection Certificate. It was an official American document that said that the bearer is an American citizen and sailor. So Frederick Douglass, dressed in sailor's clothes in Baltimore, and he got on the train heading for Philadelphia, the train going across the Mason-Dixon line from slave to free. And when the conductor came down the aisle and asked all the passengers of color for their free papers, their passes, like an apartheid system, Frederick Douglass, as he later recounted, said, I don't have a pass. He reached into his deep pocket. But I have my protection certificate with the American Eagle. I can go anywhere in the world. And the conductor said, OK, go to Philadelphia. So Frederick Douglass, who was the Martin Luther King Jr. of his generation, escaped from slavery, impersonating a sailor, because free black sailors were so common then, they just didn't cause second looks. And yet when I went into the archives 150 years later, trying to reconstruct the story of those guys, a lot of well-meaning archivists told me, trying to help me, I don't think you're going to find much. There really weren't too many black guys that worked on boats. Yeah. How do we know what we know? Yeah, we get, we get sidelined sometimes. George Henry, another great slave sailor story, escaped. Well, first sailed in as skipper, as captain of these little schooners in, in Virginia, in the Chesapeake Bay. Later went to uh, Providence, Rhode Island. He said, I got to Providence. I was forced to come down from my high position as captain and take up my wheelbarrow or whitewash brush. I could go to sea out of Providence as cook on a schooner, but they wouldn't let me sail as captain. He was perfectly competent. He could have sailed as captain. In slave territory, he was a captain. He had four guys under him, all slaves, and they sailed all around Chesapeake Bay. He comes up here, they go down Narragansett Bay. Boy, you can be the cook. That was how racial logic worked at this time. It wasn't about the skill that he had or didn't have. Robert Smalls, hero of the Civil War who stole this Confederate gunboat and turned it over to the Union forces. Now we get back to our six African-American men on the Essex. Boys like this, hanging around the waterfront, wondering what they were going to do. 
realizing that one of the jobs open to them in America in 1819, 1820, is to ship aboard a whale ship. You've all heard of Sojourner Truth, I suspect, great black prophetess woman, a mystic uh, evangelist, woman's right advocate. Sojourner Truth's son Peter shipped on a whale ship. A runaway slave named John Thompson shipped on a whale ship and wrote a narrative. There's lots and lots and lots of examples of, uh, of former slaves, runaway slaves, going to sea, come to New Bedford and Nantucket, not too many questions asked, ending up in a whale boat. So it's very common. The whaling industry sucked in men. It had this hunger for labor. Men of color would show up in this period. Captains wouldn't ask too many questions guys would ship out. So the seven men to start with, later six because one deserted in Ecuador, the seven men of color who manned the Essex in 1819 in uh, Nantucket had been brought by a labor agent called a crimp from the mainland to, uh, to sign aboard that ship. In other words, going to be white Nantucket officers, a few other white men from away as the harpooners or mid-level officers, but then uh, seven men of color as the common sailors and the cook. Occupational hazards. Some of us face traffic jams, you know, but uh, these guys had other occupational hazards. But clearly, a depiction here of an African American man. All the pictures I've shown you have a man very carefully depicted as a black man in the picture by the artist at the time. And pictures like this were hanging in plain sight in the New Bedford Whaling Museum, in the Greenwich Maritime Museum in London, in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. They were not hidden, really. And yet, when I would go and ask about this, Archivists would suggest me you're not going to find much. Well, ultimately, not only did I find an avalanche of documentary evidence, but I found all these images of African American sailors hiding in plain sight. Captain Absalom Boston was an Nantucketer. Captain Absalom Boston was a little bit younger than the men who shipped out on the Essex. By the 1830s, some Nantucket Quakers decided that they wanted, in an explicitly race enterprise, to send a black man to sea as captain. A number of other black Nantucketers were perfectly capable of having sailed as captains, but they had never been given the chance. So uh, Absalom Boston was sent to sea as a skipper of a Nantucket whaling ship in the 1830s. This painting hangs in the Nantucket Historical Society today. What I like about this so much is that he was very conscious of his status as a ship captain. White shirt, tie, suit jacket, okay? He's made it. He's like an upper middle class guy. He's a professional in his society. But he also got these big hoop earrings. There was no white Yankee captains in that era wearing big hoop earrings, okay? This guy sat for his painting and he wanted to convey these multiple identities. He wanted to convey different things about himself. Later, of course, by the time of the Civil War, many black American men shipped out and fought for Jubilee, fought in the Union Navy. Images like this from the uh, Union archives. But after the Civil War, the turning point in the book I've written uh, explains that, unfortunately, this industry that had been so welcoming to men of color, increasingly they were the last hired and the first fired after the war. And seafaring that had been a bastion of black employment in America became less and less the case, with one exception, whaling. Right after the Civil War, petroleum was discovered in Pennsylvania. Americans thirst for oil went from whales to oil wells. So whaling hung on, but after the Civil War it was never as prominent, as dynamic an industry as it had been when Nantucket and New Bedford dominated global whaling. But what do we have here? This is 1905, the whale ship Daisy out of New Bedford in the Antarctica hunting whales. And what do we see? A number of men of color, increasingly not just African-American men, Cape Verdean men, men from the Azores, men from the West Indies. This series of remarkable images were all five-inch square black and white photographs on glass plate negatives. They were taken by a guy named Robert Cushman Murray aboard that ship, who then when he got back, sent the glass plate negatives to the Museum of Natural History in New York City where they were hand tinted with watercolors. So what we have from 1905 are in effect color photographs of the tail end of whaling under sail. And what we see is that many of the men aboard ship were men of color, Cape Verdean, Azorean, West Indian, African American men. 
peeling the blubber from the whale, the sort of thing that would have been familiar to the lads on the Essex. Bailing out the head matter from a sperm whale, the spermaceti. Cutting up the pieces of dead whale on the deck of the ship to throw them into the cauldron to boil out the oil. So men like this from the whale ship Sunbeam, now two generations after the men of the Essex, this is the 1880s, are still going out in the world, challenging themselves, making themselves as they could. This guy sat for a formal photographic portrait in St. Helena, way down in the South Atlantic. He's there in a Sunday best holding a shark skin cane. That cane is made of the vertebrae or the backbone of a shark. I don't know what he intended with the image. Maybe he's going to bring it home to his mother. Maybe he's going to give it to his girlfriend. Maybe he's going to just remember when he was young and loose in the world. So, the next time you run into the narrative of Ola da Equiano, which I encourage you to read, or you see some of these amazing paintings and photographs of men of color from this era at sea. You think about these guys at the masthead, at the oars, at the steering wheel, steering for a better day, making themselves out of the circumstances in which they found themselves. Which takes us back to the Essex. And here we have the Essex with, up in the right hand corner, Tom's Nickerson, the cabin boy who wrote one account. Down the lower left corner, Owen Chase, the chief mate who wrote the other account that Melville read. Owen Chase tormented later in life with insanity because of this heroic small boat voyage that he had to endure. And I put in Absalom Boston, third generation black Nantucketer. He wasn't on the Essex, but some of his people were. They'd often been forgotten in the stories that we told. Now you have to understand what happened. The three boats departed from the ship. Two months to the day after that ship had been wrecked and they had decided not to sail to Tahiti for fear of cannibals, they began to eat their shipmates. The first few shipmates that died were just buried at sea, dropped into the ocean. But as the next man died, one of the black men, the other guy said, we gotta eat him, and they started to eat him. And as the other men died subsequently, black and white, they were eaten by their shipmates. Until finally, the boats, the three boats were separated. They'd gotten separated from each other in the immensity of the sea. One boat was never recovered. Uh, we don't know really what happened to them. There's an idea that they washed up on this island where they died. But two boats, Captain Pollard's boat with some white Nantucketers and Owen Chase, uh, Chief Mate Owen Chase's boat with some Nantucketers persisted at sea. Ultimately, Captain Pollard presided over the execution of his own nephew. His own nephew, a young boy, teenager. There were four of them in the boat, and Barzilla Ray finally said, we're going to die. We need to draw lots so that one of us be killed to survive the others. So they drew lots, and Owen Coffin drew the short straw. And then they drew lots again for who was going to execute him. And one of his shipmates and one of his friends, they'd been lads in Nantucket together, they're both like 16, 17 years old, shot the other one. And then they ate him. And within a few weeks, they were rescued. Captain Pollard got to come home and tell his own aunt with whose son he had been entrusted that he not only took the boy to sea, but that he encountered this tragedy and that they'd ultimately not only killed the boy, but eaten him. That was a tough homecoming. Chief Mate Chase lived long, but went crazy by the end of his life. But in the interim, what you can get your heads around, what you can get your heads around is that all of the survivors that, were, that lived in the boats. There were five men survived that made the boat voyage. Three other men had stayed on Henderson Island halfway through this heroic boat voyage. And they said, no, I'm not going back in the boats. I'm going to take my chances here. I might die on a deserted desert island. Who the heck knows what's coming, but I'm not going back in those boats. Those three men were later picked up when Pollard said, we left three guys on Henderson Island. But of the five men in the boats, the captain, the chief mate, and three sailors, one of whom was the cabin boy, they all went back to sea. It wasn't like this freaked them out. Well, this did freak them out. But they all went back to sea. It's what they did. And they all rose to command. Every single one of them became a shipmaster and spent years, decades, going to sea. And then they retired and ultimately did other things as old men on shore. These were Quakers with a vengeance. These were Nantucketers who knew the sea, who changed the sea, who were shaped by the sea. It's a tragic story. It's a compelling story. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to. As I've said before, it's a story that gets in your bones. Thank you. <clears throat>
So if anyone has questions, I'm happy to field questions about Philbrick's book or about African American seafaring, or about historical research or writing, or mm, the Red Sox. You know. The ship that was portrayed uh, that you said was in St. Michael's? Oh yeah, that's that schooner that's in St. Mike's now, yeah. St. Michael's Angels we're referring to. Mm. St. Michael's, Maryland, sorry. That, that schooner was, uh, she was out of Salem, Massachusetts when she was painted with that crew of the white and black men aboard. And then the painting uh, is now owned by the Maritime Museum in St. Michael's, Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. What, what other islands in the Caribbean did you visit? Oh, in the 70s? Um, just about all of them except Trinidad. I mean, I spent a lot of time... Uh, I spent years down there, and I, uh, I had actually not been to Montserrat until last year. I wanted to go to Montserrat, but I spent a lot of time in Beckley. I spent time in Barbados. I spent time in the Virgin Islands, a lot of trips in Haiti, um, Nevis, St. Kitts, uh, trips in Jamaica, Hispaniola. I mean, I've been all over the place, you know, except not Trinidad. A couple trips to Cuba. I'm a rare guy of my age. I've been to Cuba a few times. Yeah. You have the West Indian connection? Or? From St. Martin, okay. Yes, I've, I've been in St. Martin years ago, but yes. Just sailed by St. Martin again last winter, but uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, the two images I showed, there's the right whale. Unfortunately, the population of North Atlantic right whales is about 240 animals today. They're virtually all known and named. You can go on these whale watch boats out of uh, Plymouth, Mass, or Hyannis, or uh, Rye, New Hampshire, during the summer and see them. They, they spend the summer up here feeding, and then they go back down towards the Turks and Caicos in the winter where they have their babies, and then they come back up the coast to feed. So the, the North Atlantic right whale is in very, very tough shape in terms of its population. Um, the shipping lanes into Boston just a few years ago were changed to go around the Stellwagen Bank, which is a, a undersea feature there on which those whales feed, because commercial ships were hitting some of these remaining right whales. The sperm whale population, those are the toothed whales, which the Nantuckers later chased, and it's the kind of whale that <laughs> rammed the ship. The sperm whale population globally is in much better shape. There, we believe there are several million sperm whales. Which sounds like a lot until you think, oh yeah, that's like the population of New Hampshire and Vermont. <laughs> it's like not so much, but, but globally right now, um, the right whale population's in tough shape, North Atlantic one, but the sperm whale population's in pretty good shape. Anybody else? Questions about writing or research? You know, I'm, uh, yeah, Denise? So uh, it seems to me that Philbrick is a little bit ambivalent about the idea of race in the heart of the sea, because alternately, you know, he talks about um, on, the, on the Essex, the uh, black sailors are in a certain area of the ship that was a little less uh, mm -hmm. nice of a place than the white sailors. Oh. They're all getting sort of bad quality food, but the black sailors are getting <coughs> just slightly a degree less. Right. Um, however, uh, there's still a degree of equality Yep. in other ways, mm -hmm. and once they get on, once the ship is sunk and they get on the small uh, whale boats, um, again, there's this, if, this two things going on at once. The yeah. majority of the black sailors end up in the, in the boat together with the third mates, yes. not with the Nantucketers. Right. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to spreading out provisions, all of them, no matter who they are, where they're from, receive equal amounts. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be two sides of the same coin going on all the time. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Yes, I can comment on that for hours if you'd like. <laughs> uh, anybody who thinks race is simple is missing the big picture. It is so freaking complicated, okay? And so Nathaniel Philbrick, you know, he's a white guy. I guess some of you have met him, uh, wrote the book. And he... He wondered why was it that none of the black guys survived. And he did some demographic digging. Not a big surprise to us. In America of 1820, black Americans' life expectancy was statistically much shorter than that of white Americans. Black Americans didn't eat as well. They weren't as well, as well fed, as good nutrition. They had worse medical care. 
Lo and behold, guys, look around the United States today and ask yourself if everyone in the country has the same life expectancy. You know, would you rather be a well-to-do white person in coastal Massachusetts or a poor black woman in rural Mississippi? Which one's going to have a longer life expectancy? Okay, so, so it turned out that Philbrick asked the question, when the guys actually got into the boats, now we're sort of starting from scratch, the ship has sunk, we're in these lifeboats, whale boats, said, you know what? A well-fed man like Captain Pollard, who tended towards the rotund, that, you're going to last a long time. But the black men are, are less well-fed and less healthy by nature, just by being black. And now they've been on this ship for almost a year. And as Denise said, they've sailed around the Atlantic, down around Cape Horn. The provisions fed to the men in the forecastle, that's the pointy, the forward end of the ship, were not as good as what the white Nantucketers got in the steerage and not nearly as good as what the officers got back in the aft cabin. That's how hierarchy works, okay? And so Philbrick, I think, was sensitive to the racial dynamics aboard ship and he was aware of the fact that in certain ways these guys were like all in the same boat and they did stand by their shipmates, but there were other what we would call systemic or structural inequalities that meant the black men had had less of a chance from the beginning. I think it's, it's this profound irony that all of them who lived owed their lives to the actions of William Bond, the steward of color, who dove back into the aft cabin as the ship was sinking to save the navigational instruments. Otherwise, it would have been toast. They're out in the middle of the Pacific without having an idea of how to get somewhere. So it's very complicated. And <laughs> Here's a little thing. I do this sometimes with people just to trifle with them. Okay, we're going to play a little game. You walk into your university's gymnasium tomorrow and you're introduced to two 20-year-old, good-looking, strong men. One's a black man, one's a white man. And you're told that one of these guys is the captain of the football team and one of these guys is the captain of the swim team. Which is which? Anybody want to play my game? Today, year of our Lord 2013, you're at a New England university and you're standing in the foyer of the gymnasium and there's two good looking strong young guys standing in front of you. One's a black guy, one's a white guy. And you're told one of them is the captain of the football team, one of them is the captain of the swim team. Which is which? Clearly. Clearly. Why are these young people not responding? <laughs> Come on. What's that? You would automatically assume the black man was a football player and the white kid was a swimmer. I'm with you. I happen to agree exactly with you. And the reason we say that right now is because we sort of know or assume that not many African Americans are into swimming. There's a few exceptions, but more st it's more likely this black kid is a football player. Okay? I'm with you. It's true. 250 years ago, if you were standing on a pier in Boston or on a beach in Jamaica and you got these two 20-year-old guys in front of you, athletic guys, good-looking guys, one black, one white, and you said, which of these dudes can swim? Anybody with me? Who could swim? The African guys could swim like fish, okay? African guys, they swam, they were West Indians, they were pearl divers, they were salvage masters. Could some white kid from Boston swim? Water's too cold. <laughs> they don't swim. So, so my point is, what we know about race is that today, black guys don't swim. But what we knew about race 250 years ago, everybody knew what black guys swim like fish, white guys can't swim for beans, okay? So it's just a silly little thing that I do. It's historically based, but it makes us think about how we know what we know. And the fact that these racial attributes are not enduring through time, they're sort of, you know, structured by circumstance, culture, so, anyway. Um, Anybody have any questions about writing or research or anything else? Uh, stories? Lots of stories. Yeah. Yes? Just another question. If you, you said at the end that all five of the white men went on to sail again and uh -huh. be leaders. Uh -huh. Was the cannibalism an issue at all? <laughs> Good question. Was it publicized? It was publicized. It was openly known as soon as the survivors. There were uh, two men, Captain Pollard and uh, Ramsdell, 
Charles Ramsdell were in Pollard's boat. And then in Owen Chase's boat, we had Owen Chase, we had Thomas Nickerson, who was the cabin boy, and we had Benjamin Lawrence. Okay, thank you. So they're all five uh, Nantucketers. They were rescued separately about a week apart, the two boats. They were each picked up by another ship. Immediately, they told their stories. They immediately, like, unloaded, okay? And so there are some interviews that remain where the captains and other people who heard them telling their stories wrote down, we just picked up these castaways, and they said, lo and behold, that they ate their shipmates, and they drew lots in one boat and killed a man and ate him, and uh, oh, lo and behold, that was the captain's nephew, and so or cousin. Um, so the cannibalism was open, it was known, it was also accepted. It was, a, it was a situation that was justified by the customs of the sea in extremists, even the, the murder, okay? Um, Captain Pollard's aunt apparently never spoke to him again because he'd eaten her son. But Captain Pollard uh, shipped out of Nantucket again as master of a whale ship. They gave him trust again. Didn't work out so well, but he came home. He was a night watchman for 40 years. He was apparently a guy who ultimately became comfortable with himself, could live through this. Chief mate Chase, a much more driven individual, much more type A alpha kind of guy, he couldn't handle it. Uh, ultimately, he, he was more successful in the short run in life making a living, but by the time he got to 60 or so, he went crazy. So. Um, the cannibalism was known. It was open. Um, as the proper Nantucketers said, we don't talk about the Essex. But in the bigger picture, everybody knew what had gone down. So, yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Thanks for coming. You've been a great audience.